approaches that we the approaches that we use in my lab um, are, are quite varied, and I will take you through some of these um, approaches that we actually utilize. So some of you might be aware that South Africa really is very much well known for its biodiversity. It is regarded as a mega biodiverse center, and we have three different um, hotspots with very varied flora in these different regions. Some of our most iconic species happen to be the proteas, like the king protea, which happens to be South Africa's national flower. And then also we are very much species rich when it comes to the diversification of ericas and uh, restios. That biodiversity is very much unique and it is quite beautiful. And in different parts of South Africa, you will find different species like this Erythrina kafra. And I was actually um, doing some field work in this region in July, and these particular plants were already in bloom. So I'm actually working in this particular region right here, which is the Cape Floristic region. And the green area is where the fane moss actually is found. And then the light um, yellow um, area is the succulent karoo. And this light yellow area is an area where plants like the quiver tree are actually found. And if you carry on and travel all the way up towards Namibia, then you'll start to meet vilvichias, which are very ancient plants but are actually quite exquisite. So the biodiversity is quite remarkable. Um, in this part of the world, we are very much interested in the rugby and the local rugby team has the dyser as its um, emblem. And you'll find these dyzers actually flowering right up on Table Mountain, usually in February. So there've been many different questions that have been asked in terms of why this remarkable biodiversity and how did it come about and why did South Africa and the southern tip of Africa end up being so species rich. And there are several different hypotheses that have been proposed and some of this um, is linked to uh, recent and older um, radiations and, and also the varied landscapes and ecological environments that these plants have actually um, managed to cope and live in. So if you travel a little bit out of Cape Town and pull yourself into the Tankwa Karoo, which is a desert environment, at some times of the year, it really just explodes into, um, into, into flowers. And I've just recently been there to go on a collection for Skeletium, which is one of the plants I'll talk about a little bit later. But one can see that we have many different environments. Our landscapes are very varied. And this has um, led to some of this biodiversity. We also here in the Cape Floristic region are in a fire prone environment. And of course, that smoke is very important for the life strategies of the plants that actually are found here. The proteas actually require the smoke for seed dispersal and also for um, seed germination. And sometimes, believe it or not, we end up with some snow and in places like Table Mountain, there have been moments where snow has actually fallen on those mountains, but you'll find that the mountains around Stellenbosch will often have snow during the winter. And the area that I actually come from in the Hoxback Mountain um, has beautiful moraes and streptocarpus, and often it will also have moments where there's actually snow. So these geoclimatic conditions that are you know, taking place throughout the whole entire time are also thought to be important for the diversity of species that are actually found here. 
And the plants in the Cape in particular have acquired interesting nutrient acquisition strategies because the soils are very old and they happen to be low on phosphate and low on nitrogen. And they have developed mycorrhizal associations as well as um, cluster roots, which are assisting in acquiring different nutrients. So our landscapes are really quite beautiful, beautiful, very much varied. Our flora is quite spectacular and very interesting. And some of these plants are actually used for medicinal purposes, such as this diascorea or elephant's foot. And these conophytums that I'm actually showing here are amongst the plant species that are being heavily poached and being taken to other parts of the world because people find them interesting and quite curious. And during this time of the year where we have spring, uh, many of the landscapes will actually explode into, into flower. And you can see me jumping here on top of some bulbous plants that are actually found in the Nevoteville area. So the biodiversity is really quite lovely and very interesting, but we also have a lot of cultural diversity as South Africans. And this is obviously linked to our history, which saw the Bantu people moving down from Central Africa into the Southern tip, meeting up with the Kwekwe and the San people who were the first um, peoples to actually live in this part of the world. And then as time went on, you had the Dutch settlers that actually arrived, arrived here and the British uh, settlers as well, who brought along people that came from the East. And this has really generated a very interesting ethnopharmacopoeia that's very much unique and pretty much South African. And the people that live in these areas actually are much reliant on this biodiversity that is actually found here. And that biodiversity is said to connect them to their history and connect the people to their ancestors. And for somebody that's interested in studying medicinal plants, this makes for a really wonderful place to interact with people that have ancient knowledge that's associated with plants that are found in the area. And it's quite interesting that African traditional medicines are much more um, carried through oral histories. And this is in contrast, for example, to Chinese traditional medicines where recipes that are associated with the medicines have long been documented. And so part of the work that we do as researchers in this part of the world is really to try and understand the ethnobotany of the plants that are actually found here. And that is very much um, interesting work. And one of the reasons people are still relying on traditional medicines is because we have a situation where we have much more traditional healers and indigenous medicine men um, in comparison to medical doctors. And that has also led to the traditional um, and indigenous knowledge being exploited by natural uh, medicines producers to produce a variety of different um, products such as rooibos. And rooibos farming, for example, is very important because it is part of a livelihood generation system in places where it is actually found. And here in the Cape, you find the Cape Bush Doctor or the Bossy Doctor. Corbus, that's for you, just to remind you of uh, that little bit of Afrikaans. And um, the Bush Doctors are the main commodifiers of medicinal um, plants. And they interact a lot with the different uh, plants from the Cape Floristic region. And when we look at the history of the study of the phytochemistry of plants in South Africa, I think it's quite interesting to take Skeletium as an example. 
And I will talk a little bit more about this particular species. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I will talk a little bit more about it. And I can show some of these specimens that I have with me a little bit later on. So Skeletium uh, was identified by Simon van der Stel, who was the governor of the Cape way back in the 1600s as having economic potential after he noted how the local people um, were getting exceedingly happy after taking and consuming Skeletium. And it was in the 1970s where mesembrine alkaloid chemistry was being investigated. What's really quite interesting is that it is post-1994, so that's during the abolishment of apartheid, that the South African government actually realized that the flora that we have here is really a botanical gold. And so many different studies that are linked to ethnopharmacology, including in vitro assays and in vivo assays um, were initiated and a product like Skeletium actually went into being um, analyzed using clinical trials in the uh, 2000s. And there's even more uh, work that's being conducted in order to be able to understand the biodiversity that's associated with this particular species. And so this brings me to some of the work that we do in my particular laboratory. We do utilize a variety of different phytochemical tools. Um, this includes using a metabolomics pipeline that often requires us to go out into the field to collect wild specimens, which we then um, extract using various means. And then ultimately we run these um, on a liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, based analysis. And then we pretty much study the chemistry. And at the same time, I'm also interested in utilizing various biotechnological strategies that can either be used for um, exploitation of these plants for um, as a conservation system or to be able to feed into commercial industries or as a tool to study, study specialized metabolism. So Skeletia, which is um, the first plant that I'm gonna talk about, um, has mesembrine alkaloids, as I previously indicated. These mesembrine alkaloids are, uh, are quite important because they give you a sense of euphoria once you actually use them. And the tradition that's associated with this is drying the material and then chewing that material and um, using this to uplift mood. And very recently, there are products that are generated um, from uh, Skeletium. So we've been doing various different um, projects with regards to this particular species. And one of the projects that we have been doing is actually utilizing molecular networking to try and better understand the chemistry that is associated with um, Skeletium. And I'm not necessarily gonna share that um, today, but uh, Kaylin Reddy, who's a PhD student, collected uh, plants from various different localities across the Skeletium genus. And these plants pretty much look the same. And so we have been utilizing the uh, metabolomic signatures as a way to try and um, understand this particular biodiversity. What's quite interesting is that plants that might come from the same environment might be exceedingly variable. So one of the questions that we are trying to um, answer with some of the work that we are actually doing is to try and find um, chemotypes that actually produce high levels of um, mesembrine alkaloids and that have a greater diversity of the different uh, mesembrines that are actually found in Skeletium. And one of the other uh, questions that we've also been trying to better understand um, is related to how we can utilize this molecular networking to uh, delineate um, 
uh, networks that are attached to the different uh, populations. And at the same time, um, this molecular networking approach has actually shown us that there are many different um, unknown alkaloids that are actually associated with these particular um, species. Um, the other work that we've been doing has been attached to um, understanding the distribution of, of mesembrines um, across the plant body. And what's quite interesting is that different parts of the plant have different levels of um, mesembrine. And you can see here that this particular leaf that's sitting at uh, leaf five um, has got um, quite different uh, levels in comparison to the stems. And the age of the plant also has an impact in terms of the amount of the mesembrines that are accumulating and even the types of mesembrines that are actually accumulating in, 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 in that particular uh, plant. It's also quite apparent that um, there's still much to be resolved in terms of mesembrine biosynthesis. And the last studies that were conducted in respect to this were in, in the 1970s. So we are still trying to understand um, which way these pathways are actually flowing. And we think that some of the tools that we have been able to develop in, in our environment might ultimately be able to assist us in actually answering some of these questions. So what's also quite interesting is that mesembrine biosynthesis is thought to be derived um, from um, tyrosine. And interestingly enough, beta lanes that also accumulate in um, plants such as skeletium that be belong to the caryophyllales um, uh, are utilizing tyrosine as a means to uh, generate uh, beta lanes. So one of the questions that we are actually uh, interested in is trying to understand whether um, mesembrine biosynthesis actually shares um, uh, the same precursor and how that actually influences the production of uh, mesembrine when plants are stressed. Are you getting more uh, beta lane production? And does that actually lower uh, mesembrine biosynthesis? So we have been conducting a variety of different studies to uh, understand stress in relation to uh, the, me the mesembrines. And we have been using um, salt treatments as well as a nutrient uh, stress um, set of treatments. And we do this in tissue culture as we have developed a very nice tissue culture system that generates a lot of clonal plants for us to be able to do this. And what's interesting about this is that some of the metabolites that are thought to be important for the bioactivity that's linked to skeletium are really um, impacted um, by different stresses, such as in this particular case where the plants aren't uh, given uh, sufficient nitrogen, but they're actually under high levels of uh, salt stress or, uh, uh, or um, phosphate stress. Um, and these metabolites actually disappear. Why are we interested in doing this? Well, one of the things that is um, leading us to conduct these kinds of experiments is the hypothesis that it might be, um, it might be possible that um, environments in the Cape are going to get much more um, salty um, as plants are actually under climate related stress that might be associated with drought. And what was interesting in this particular respect, when we did a proteome analysis 
was that many of the um, proteins that were actually um, changing were linked to um, uh, photosynthesis and general um, central metabolism. So I wanna switch gears now and talk about a different species because of course we have many medicinal plants as I indicated earlier. And this particular plant is a legume that belongs to the family Fabaceae, and it is only found in Southern Africa, and it is found in different um, environments here in South Africa. So we have been quite interested in this because it is a commercially important um, species, and it's also utilized for a variety of different uh, treatments. And this may include uh, diabetes, it's also used to control stress. And in Afrikaans, it's called kanker bush or cancer bush. And it has a long history of being used as an anti-cancer agent by the Kwekwe people and the San people um, that are the Aboriginal people of South Africa. And even today, it is still utilized for anti-cancer effects. This particular plant is found in very varied environments. It's found close to uh, coastal areas. It is also found in more semi-arid areas in the Northern Cape. And it is even found in um, the Eastern Cape region that actually has more of a summer rainfall area than areas of the Western Cape and the Northern Cape. And in this particular respect, we have been chemotyping plants that are found in the wild. And we integrated this into a set of pharmacological studies that looked at the phenolic profiles, the anti-cancer activity. And what was really interesting is that you can separate out um, the plants based on where they were actually collected, and the levels of the Sutherlandins and the Sutherlandiocytes, which happen to be flavonoids and terpenoids respectively, accumulate at different um, levels based on where the plants are actually collected. And what was also interesting is that depending on the site of collection, you have variable um, pharmacological um, activity. And so our proposal in this particular respect uh, for industry is that industry should take much better care in terms of where plants are actually collected from and um, earmark those particular collections for respective pharmacological actions. At the moment, because this plant is not farmed at a large scale, and there isn't necessarily a single chemotype that is utilized to farm it, often farmers will collect materials from various areas and actually pull this um, uh, together. And this, um, through another study that we have conducted in my lab, um, has actually shown that this can actually lead to undesirable um, teratogenic effects that are linked to cytotoxicity. So with regards to the stress um, treatments that we've been conducting in this particular species, um, there are many changes that are actually taking place um, in terms of the um, primary metabolites, sugars are changing, and then polyamines are changing, and um, Proline, for example, will be changing. And all of these um, amino acids, polyamines, um, sugars are quite well known in the literature in assisting plants to be able to cope with stresses. And again, when we do some kind of proteomic analysis, we see that there are changes to photosynthesis, glycolysis, nitrogen assimilation, as well as a variety of heat shock proteins and other structural proteins. And um, this might not necessarily um, be, um, be leading to great changes 
with regards to the Sutherlandia sites, but there are many different changes that are actually taking place in relation to the soya saponin uh, content. And at the moment, we are really unsure about whether it is the Sutherlandio sites, which are terpenes, or the soya saponins that might actually be responsible for this anti-cancer effect that's associated with this plant. What is um, interesting is that there seems to be some kind of connection with regards to um, changes at the central metabolomic um, level that is possibly influencing um, specialized metabolism. And those metabolites are mainly belonging to the groups of um, caamphorols, uh, flavones, these special metabolites that are only found in uh, Sutherlandia, such as the Sutherlandins and the um, Sutherlandio sites. And much of the work that's been associated with the species has also led us to better characterize um, the extracts that are actually found in this particular plant. So now I wanna change gears and talk about a project that I conducted together with um, um, Elaine Hussens at the University of Ghent. And this was a shared uh, project where we did uh, work with uh, Janine Colling, who spent nine months in Ghent and nine months in South Africa doing a PhD. And this involved um, a, a gene that was isolated in Elaine Hussens' lab and we transformed Arabidopsis, and at the same time, we also transformed Sutherlandia to try and understand whether the effects of this taximin signaling peptide would be similar in different species. What was quite interesting was that in um, Arabidopsis, many of the changes were associated with the morphology of um, these plants and growth patterns of the leaves, and other parts. And in Sutherlandia, we couldn't necessarily see these um, strange uh, phenotypes. However, um, under treatment of um, methyl gismonic acid, you could see that um, soya saponin levels in different clones were actually um, increased. And so we think that this could be an interesting system um, as a way to get access to these interesting soya saponins. And the last um, plant that I'm going to talk about is Dodonea viscosa, which is a species that's found in different parts of the world. It is found in places like China, India, in Australia, it's found in other parts of Africa apart from Southern Africa, such as Kenya. And in this particular regard, we collected plants from the wild and then we also set up a cultivation system and used a cup garden experiment to try and understand whether the differences that we see in the wild growing chemotypes are influenced by the environment or is there some kind of genetic um, control that might be uh, uh, um, um, that might be inter interrelated with these plants, or is it just a combination of genetics and environment that is actually controlling um, the metabolism? This has been a really interesting project because for this particular project. We've actually been uh, working together with a group of Rastafarian um, herbalists who base their traditions on the Kwe and the San people. And it has led us to have a relationship where we are doing bioprospecting together. And this, of course, um, integrates um, some aspects that are linked to the Nagoya protocol. And at the same time, it is in alignment with the laws of South Africa that actually uh, control genetic uh, materials, indigenous knowledge, um, in an act that was set up 
as the Biodiversity Act of South Africa in 2004. So we collected plants from various areas and we also tested these plants using an anti-cancer assay together with Prof. Anamart Engelbrecht, who's here at the University of Stellenbosch. And what was quite interesting was that the extract is able to reduce the, the tumors in a mouse model, but the weight of the animals actually continues to be good. The animals were healthy. And so we think that we could utilize this extract as an adjuvant treatment together with other chemotherapies such as doxorubicin that's often utilized for anti-cancer patients. So this study is ongoing and we have also carried on doing work where we have shown that these extracts have got anti-androgenic effects and we are thinking that together with the bush doctors, we will be able to commercialize this particular species. And um, we did a study that took us to three different areas. And these areas are out in the mountains, some are in the, uh, close to the sea, and of course, Stellenbosch. And what was really interesting was that when we grow these plants in a common garden experiment, the metabolomic clustering is pretty much similar to the patterns that we actually see in wild cultivated um, plants or wild growing plants. And so this led us to be able to do a microsatellite analysis of the different populations and we could confirm that the Stellenbosch and the De Hoop populations, which are much closer to the sea, are seeming to have a similar genetic structure. And the plants that are inside the Cedarburg Mountains seem to be an isolated um, ecotype um, where not much genetic material is actually being shared. And we also looked at the uh, photosynthesis rates and um, stomatal conduct conductance as well. And what was interesting was that the Cedarberg plants seem to always do something that is a little bit different to those plants that are growing in Stellenbosch and De Hoop. So this has taken us to expand that particular study. And we went recently to collect from a wide variety of different areas in South Africa. And we are hoping that by doing those collections, going out to collect different ecotypes of Dodonea, we will be able to ultimately find an ecotype that can be exploited and commercialized together with the Cape Bush doctors as our benefit sharing partners. But the indigenous knowledge that was provided by the Bush doctors has been very useful because they alluded to the fact that the Stellenbosch ecotype has better activity. And when we actually tested this, we also found that it happened to have a higher anti-cancer effect in in vitro cell lines as well as in in vivo um, studies. So I hope I've been able to convince you with um, this exploration of plants here in South Africa, that our biodiversity is interesting, our indigenous knowledge is somewhat unique, and it is an exciting place to study phytochemicals. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions.